the honorables, the presiding judge and judges of the Court of Appeals of the State of North Carolina. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, the Court of Appeals is now in session. God save the state and this honorable court. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2 p.m. session of the May 11 panel of the North Carolina Court of Appeals. I'm Judge John Arrowwood with me this afternoon is Judge Allegra Collins and Judge Fred Gore. We have one case on the calendar for argument. It's Branch Banking and Trust Company versus SunTrust Bank. We will hear from the appellants. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Uh, I'm Wolf Wong of the law firm Loeb and Loeb. I represent uh, plaintiff appellant Branch Banking and Trust Company or BB&T as I'll refer to them today. Uh, I'm joined by my co-counsel Ryan Hoffman of the law firm Alexander Ricks. Uh, and respectfully as noted earlier, I'd like to reserve 10 minutes for rebuttal. Uh, Your Honors, the reason this action was commenced uh, was to establish, among other things, the priority of the deed of trust that BB&T obtained in 2009 with respect to the property at issue, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the priority vis-a-vis -vis a later deed of trust identifying the beneficiary as GPAR FF LLC, a North Carolina entity. Um, well, well, initially you had sued SunTrust to try to establish, and I believe and understand that BB&T and SunTrust have now merged into an entity called Truist. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And that, that cause of action was settled as between SunTrust and BB&T prior to the merger. So SunTrust is no longer a party to this case. Those claims are no longer at issue. Uh, so, Your Honor, what we're trying to do in this case now with remaining on this appeal is to establish the priority of BB&T's deed, deed of trust vis-a-vis uh, -vis the one identifying GPRFF North Carolina as the beneficiary. And that deed of trust was obtained and recorded six years later, 2015. Um, unfortunately, BB&T's deed of trust was mistakenly recorded in the wrong county, and that was corrected with a proper recordation in Mecklenburg County in 2016, which was after GPAR North Carolina's deed of trust had already been recorded in Mecklenburg. So fast forward to today, and the broad issues on this appeal center on whether GPAR North Carolina's deed of trust was void ab initio, and if that's not the case, uh, nonetheless, whether reformation was improper to change the beneficiary from GPAR North Carolina to GPAR Delaware, um, with that reformation backdated to the original date of the recordation of the deed of trust identifying GPAR North Carolina as beneficiary. So parsing this a little bit finer, your honors, uh, there are several discrete issues on this appeal. Number one is whether the deed of trust uh, in GPAR's name was void ab initio, um, given that GPAR North Carolina had been dissolved before the deed of trust was executed and recorded. Number two, whether reformation uh, violated the statute of frauds and the parole evidence rule, given the absence of any ambiguity on the face of the deed of trust uh, as to who the beneficiary was intended to be. Number three, um, whether reformation, which is an equitable remedy, is properly given uh, in light of the fact that GPAR itself had participated in the preparation of the deed of trust. And number four, uh, just as a well, let's talk about equities here. Your client uh, is saying that there's no equity there because they participated, but your client relied is now relying upon something that was recorded improperly in another county and not corrected before this GPAR uh, deed of trust was placed on the public record. Isn't that correct? Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, that's not correct. We are not relying upon the 2009 deed of trust or the 2009 recordation of the deed of trust in BB&T's name in the wrong county. There, that was recorded in 2016, and my client, and we understand that completely, that priority as to any other lien holder in Mecklenburg County was not established by the 2009 recordation. And, but... The GPAR deed of trust was recorded before your deed of trust was re-recorded in Mecklenburg. Is that correct? That, that is correct, Your Honor. So in terms of recordation timing, it's absolutely correct what Your Honor just stated, that the GPAR uh, deed of trust in Mecklenburg County was recorded first. Uh, the point here being, though, on this appeal is that that deed of trust in GPAR's name was void, and therefore it doesn't even, not only does it not establish priority, but it doesn't establish anything. Uh, counsel, counsel, on that point that Judge Arwood just brought up, if uh, 
the original deed of trust that was in the wrong county would have been filed in Mecklenburg, would we be here right now? No, we would not be here, Your Honor. If the BB&T deed of trust, there's no uh, assertions made by anyone in this litigation, including GPAR, that there was any other deficiency in the BB&T deed of trust other than the fact that it was recorded in the wrong county. So speaking of equities, uh, we're not we're certainly not relying upon this on this appeal. Um, but it is a matter of record and undisputed that the BB&T deed of trust was both obtained and recorded, admittedly, in the wrong county before uh, GPAR had obtained, whichever GPAR it is, had obtained any interest in this property. So, uh, moving on to the merits issues, there are a couple of other procedural issues that I'll get into later, but as to the core merits issues, I think it's helpful to briefly review the documents to crystallize what the narrow set of facts at issue in this appeal are. Um, so with that, I'd like to share uh, the actual deed of trust, which is starts on page 66 of the record. Okay, there it is. Uh, this is the deed of trust that's at issue on this appeal. This is the one in the name of GPAR, uh, North Carolina. So um, there's, there are highlights on this that are not part of the record and that I put into this uh, for demonstrative purposes only for, for sake of this argument. Uh, but if you go down in this deed of trust. Council, uh, you can, uh, I think, be assured that we've seen this before. I, I certainly understand that, Your Honor. I just want to emphasize one aspect of this, and it's the fact that the way GPAR is characterizing this case is one where they simply misidentified the state of formation. Now, that's not an accurate representation, Your Honor. The beneficiary here is GPAR FF LLC, North Carolina Limited Liability Company, with a specified address of 6300 Carmel Road, Suite 110B, Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, if anyone who, I'd like to know, this is the only document the public sees on the register of deeds uh, in Mecklenburg, Mecklenburg County identifying who this interest holder as to this property is. It's G Park, North Carolina with the specified address. Now, if one were to go into the public record, the Secretary of State records to figure out who this entity is, this is what you'd come across. This is the certificate, the Articles of Organization in the state of North Carolina for this entity with its exact name uh, pursuant to North Carolina statute with this exact same address, 6300 Carmel Road, Suite 110B in Charlotte, with a unique identifier, uh, Secretary of State ID number that you'll see in the top right corner of this. And what you'd also find is the Articles of Dissolution for this unique entity that was previously formed in North Carolina with the same unique SOS ID number uh, with an effective date of dissolution of June 25th, 2014. Again, it's undisputed that that date was prior to the date of obtaining and recording the deed of trust in the name of GPAR uh, FF LLC, the North Carolina Limited Liability Company. So uh, what this crystallizes, Your Honor, is that this isn't simply a, a typo. They actually identify a, a real entity that anyone looking on the public record would soon learn was in fact defunct and therefore that pursuant to settled North Carolina law, this deed was void. So now I'd like to jump into the, the, the precise legal issues. Um, and I'll stop sharing this. So getting a little more granular here, um, there's uniform authority in North Carolina holding that a deed conveyed to a defunct entity is void ab initio. It's not voidable, but it's void from inception. The state of the law on this point is undisputed and in fact conceded by GPAR in its response brief. We cite to a slew of decisions on uh, pages 15 to 17 of our opening brief. Uh, this includes the Piedmont decision from the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Um, but two other decisions, I think, bear uh, emphasis here. The first one is Carcano v. JBSS. It was a 2009 decision from the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Uh, and in that case, there were deeds that purported to transfer ownership of the properties at issue to an entity called JBSS LLC, um, which the parties understood existed, but one of the parties had forgotten or declined or neglected to actually form that entity. Um, and what, what's noteworthy about this case is that the court found in that decision 
that, quote, competent evidence exists as to the existence of a mistake on the part of the browsers. And those were the individuals who were required or obligated to form that entity. And Council, the on, on the issue of, of the, I guess, the factual basis of the different cases, is there a case on point, and I didn't see it from the briefs, that talks about the North Carolina entity no longer existing, but the company still being a valid company outside of the state of North Carolina. Because uh, the case that I, I reviewed, obviously, seems to be where the company doesn't exist at all, not in another state, just at all. But is there any case on point to address that issue? Um, Your Honor, I, I'm not aware of any case that addresses that specific fact scenario. But what I would say is the fact scenario that we're dealing with here is distinguishable from that hypothetical. And that's because you're dealing with two separate and distinct entities, GPAR North Carolina and GPAR Delaware. So the point is, on the state of trust- They have the same name, though, don't they? They do have the same name, Your Honor. But the fact that GPAR North Carolina was an actual entity, and it referenced by address uh, and the state of formation, as well as the name, turns this into a case that's no different than one if uh, the reformation order that's being challenged on this appeal were one that said, let's change the beneficiary on the state of trust from GPAR North Carolina LLC to this separate affiliated corporation or LLC in Delaware that's called XYZ Corporation or XYZ LLC. There's no distinction whatsoever between those two scenarios. So it's important not to get hung up, Your Honor, in our view, just to, on the fact that these entities share the same name. They were, in fact, two separate entities. Uh, and that's a question. Well, can you talk to me a little bit about, um, I've read the reply and I but I'm not sure I understand your argument or your client's argument with respect to this Bank of Union versus Redwine case from 1916. Yes, you're right. Where they changed the name to an entire, they changed the name in this stock pledge from an individual to the bank. And yes. The Supreme Court enforced that as I read the case. Well, one of, one of the issues with that decision, Your Honor, is that it's from 1916, and the language is a little bit arcane, uh, but upon a close reading of the decision... Uh, the language is a little bit arcane, but it is still good law. Uh, I had my clerk shepherdize it, and it still appears to be good law to me. I understand that, Your Honor. The, the point here is that the proposition for which uh, GPAR cites to that decision uh, is not at all what that case stands for. The specific deed of trust uh, in that case was between Redwine um, and whoever the grantor was. There was a deed of trust. The, there was no mistake as to the identity of the beneficiary or the parties on the deed of trust that was at issue. The mistake that was referenced in that decision was a separate clause in that deed of trust that identified a prior and senior lien holder. And that was the mistake in that clause that said, uh, this deed of trust is subject to this prior lien in favor of uh, this individual W.S. Blayton. But in fact, in actuality, the prior lien holder subject to which this deed of trust was being conveyed was the, 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 the bank, Bank of Union, the plaintiff. So there was no misidentification of the parties to the deed of trust. Uh, and I'll read you, I have this right in front of me. There was a spe specific clause at issue was stated the seat of trust or certificate is subject, however, to any conveyances. Sir, I have it in front of me as well. Okay, so your honor, it, this was simply a provision in the deed of trust, not a, that where the mistake occurred as to the identity of a non-party to the deed of trust, not a mistake as to the parties to the deed of, deed of trust itself. So it has no relevance whatsoever. It's miscited in uh, the answering brief. Uh, the other noteworthy fact about that case is, in that case, the deed of trust was drawn by defendant Redwine. Uh, and the bank, who was the senior lien holder, who was not a party to the deed of trust, um, was not a party to it. The court noted this and was not represented because it was not a party in connection with that deed of trust. And under those circumstances, the court held the equities are such that this non-party senior lien holder should have the benefit of reforming this third party deed of trust between these two other parties. That's the exact opposite of what occurred here. GPAR Delaware 
according to their own affidavits, was in fact involved in the preparation of the deed of trust, and the equitable principles cited in red wine apply going the other way to preclude the equity of reformation where they didn't exercise due care and diligence in creating this document, which is the only document, again, that's on the public record in the Register of Deeds identifying who the beneficiary is of this purported interest. So uh, just to sum this up, Your Honor, as to red wine, none of the parties to the deed of trust were defunct entities or deceased individuals so as to render it void. None of the parties to the deed of trust were even misidentified, and it didn't even involve real property. It was a deed of trust as to stock certificates. Um, so arguably, the statute of frauds doesn't even apply, and that's the second argument I'll get into. Um, so separate argument from this voidness issue um, arising from the fact the deed of trust was conveyed to a defunct entity is the statute of frauds and the parole evidence rule. And it's important to note that this issue is doesn't depend at all on the deed of trust having been conveyed to a defunct entity and therefore for that reason having been void, but it's a separate and independent basis uh, that precludes reformation here. Um, it's undisputed that conveyances of real property are subject to the statute of frauds in North Carolina. Um, and the Henry Hudson case that we cite on page three of our reply is directly on point there. Deed of trust was at issue. Uh, the petitioner in that case argued that uh, the deed of trust uh, parties neglected to attach a description of the actual party that was subject to that deed of trust. And of course, the party's intent was that the deed of trust was secured um, by some property. But notwithstanding the intent, the court held that such intent is not sufficient to satisfy the statute of frauds. So the deed of trust was held to be void. It's violative of the statute of frauds. The party's intent was irrelevant. And the same principle applies here. There was no deed of trust identifying G Part Delaware as the purported beneficiary of this deed. There's no ambiguity whatsoever on the face of this deed of trust. There's no latent ambiguity. There's no patent ambiguity. It identifies a singular entity that actually existed in the state of North Carolina that happened to be defunct at the time it was granted. And the corollary proposition to this is that North Carolina law is clear that in the absence of any ambiguity, parole evidence rule in conjunction with the statute of frauds bars consideration of any extrinsic evidence to clarify the party's purported intent. That intent is drawn from the four corners of an unambiguous document. So under this authority, in the absence of any ambiguity, deed of trust can be reformed to change the beneficiary, even if the existing beneficiary was an actual entity. Again, this is a separate issue from the other reason as to why this deed is void. Um, even if it wasn't void on that other basis because G4 North Carolina was a void entity at the time of conveyance, reformation was still improper pursuant to the statute of frauds and the parole evidence rule. And we cite to a case, Perkins v. Perkins, um, where, and this wasn't the specific issue in the case, but it was a statute of frauds case where the court noted the obvious proposition that, is, that a court of chancery cannot, for example, change an agreement between A and B into one between A and C. And that's exactly what happened with the second summary judgment order of the lower court here. It changed the parties from A and B to A and C. Um, so here we would say the statute of frauds and the parole evidence rule independently preclude G Par Delaware from now claiming in the face of this unambiguous singular document that was filed in the public record that in fact G Par Delaware which isn't referenced anywhere in the deed of trust is the actual intended beneficiary. And what follows from that principle and that proposition is that the reformation order effectively created a new deed of trust to memorialize the party's purported intent as between G Part Delaware and the juries. Now we submit there are two errors in this. One, reformation isn't proper. It's not a proper vehicle to create a new instrument ever. Um, so it shouldn't have been granted in the first instance, because that's exactly what the statute of frauds prohibits. And number two, in the hypothetical scenario where reformation might nonetheless have been proper, and again, we submit that's contrary to the law, uh, but this new agreement should not have been backdated so that its efficacy goes back to the date of the recordation of the original deed, precisely because it creates a new instrument, or the effect of it is to create a new instrument. 
Now, beyond that, Your Honor, there, there are a couple of other procedural issues that I'd like to discuss, um, but those are the, the primary reasons, the statute of frauds, the parole evidence rule, and the uh, undisputed common law doctrine, the deeds granted to defunct entities are void ab initio and can't be revived or reformed. Um, but beyond that, there were certain other errors in the lower court decisions, uh, we would argue. Uh, one of those is that there was no evidence here submitted to establish that there was, in fact, a mutual mistake as between the parties to this transaction. Now, I understand GPAR Delaware submitted affidavits uh, purported to set forth its intent. Um, but one point before I get to uh, this issue is to point out this evidence, none of it's admissible pursuant to the parole evidence rule and the statute of frauds. So this issue is secondary and ancillary to the primary issues. But even assuming reformation was proper, the statute- Is there any objection to that evidence being admissible? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, well, one, I'd like to start by saying there was no evidence whatsoever submitted uh, as to the intent of Michelle Drury, who was one of the grantors on the deed of trust. We have evidentiary objections to the evidence submitted uh, with respect to Dr Joseph Drury's intent, who was the other grantor. And the only evidence that was submitted in regards to his intent was an affidavit submitted by Thomas Lyon, who was an attorney, not for Joe Drury, but for an entity called Tri-Cities, which was not a party to the deed of trust. Um, we took take an issue with that in our reply papers. And in response, I mean, I'm sorry, in our, moving, in our opening brief, and in response to that, GPAR stated that the lack of evidence is not the same as evidence to the contrary. Now, of course, GPAR was granted summary judgment. And as the movement, they're putting the burden of proof, they're turning it upside down. And they're the ones as the movement who bore the burden of proof in establishing its entitlement to summary judgment. And part of that is to establish that there was mutual mistake on the part of all parties to the deed of trust. Again, there was no evidence submitted as to Michelle Drury's intent. The intent as to Joe Drury was submitted by an attorney for a separate entity. And the only evidence, even in that affidavit, uh, and this is a statement from GPAR's legal brief, is that Mr. Lyon would have had conversations with Mr. Drury because he was a principal of Tri-Cities. But the affidavit itself doesn't identify any such conversations. And in any event, going to the issue of evidentiary objections, that would be classic hearsay in any event, even if those statements were- Can you point me where in the trial court record that you were, that you objected in the trial court to the admission of any of that? Your Honor, I think that would be in the uh, opposition, our, our opposition to GPOR's summary judgment papers. I can't. But I'm talking about in the hearing itself, in the transcript of the hearing itself, can you appoint me to anywhere that you objected to that? You've said you did, so I'm asking you to appoint me to it. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, what I was saying was that this issue was raised in the uh, briefs on this appeal. I will get back oh, to you. It's raised in the briefs on the appeal, not below. Uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head right now as to whether that transcript and the particular papers where those objections may have been raised are actually part of the record on this appeal and therefore whether it's yours or not. Well, you do know that briefs filed in opposition to motions for summary judgment in North Carolina are not a part of the record, don't you? I do understand that, Your Honor. But the point is the burden of proof, Your Honor, was upon setting aside the evidentiary objections. There is a burden of proof on summary judgment as to which any lingering doubt, if there's a genuine issue of material fact, the burden of proof is upon the movement to establish the absence of any genuine issue of material fact, and any inferences are drawn against the movement here. And the point is they didn't satisfy their burden of proof, uh, setting aside the hearsay objection, they didn't satisfy their burden of proof as to Joe Drury's intent because there were no statements made in the affidavit of Tom Lyon even if assuming that that was admissible hearsay for some reason, uh, there were no statements attributed to Joe Drury in that affidavit or any other evidence submitted as to Joe Drury's intent. So as to both Michelle Drury and uh, Joseph Drury, no competent evidence was submitted to show uh, either of their intent with respect to who the beneficiary on this deed of trust was supposed to be. 
Uh, and we would submit on a summary judgment motion to establish mutual mistake among the parties to the deed of trust. They were required to submit conclusive evidence as to all of their intent that G. Part Delaware was supposed to be the intended beneficiary. None of that exists. Council on the, on that issue um, and proving mutual mistake. Um, there's Willis versus Willis, which is uh, North Carolina Supreme Court case. Clerks and I were able to kind of review that, and it seems to be another analysis to also include unilateral mistakes induced by fraud or others, or mistake of the draftsman. Um, are you familiar with that case and prepared to address the additional wrongs that seems to have created to allow for reformation or summary judgment um, as a basis? Uh, Your Honor, I, I don't believe those those cases were cited um, by either party or that case, Willis. Um, I, I'm not prepared to address it. I am prepared to address the general point about mistakes by draftsmen. Um, and what I would revert back to is this is the ancillary and tertiary issue on this appeal. The other issues that we discussed earlier, Your Honors, are the primary issues that this deed was void ab initio and that the statute of frauds precludes in the parole evidence rule in the absence of any ambiguity on the face of the deed itself precludes uh, any consideration of any extrinsic evidence about mutual mistake, unilateral mistake, what the draftsman intended. So that would be my response to that to the extent there's case law out there stating that a unilateral mistake, contrary to my understanding, uh, could be sufficient to uh, justify reformation uh, or that mutual mistake can be uh, inferred uh, even on summary judgment uh, based upon draftsman's uh, evidence or statements. Council, you're down to about three minutes and 50 seconds. So I, do you want to reserve the rest of that? Yes, I would like to reserve uh, the remainder of my time. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll hear from the appellee. Good afternoon, uh, Ken Rayner of the Mecklenburg County Bar, and I represent G. Uh, Park Mr. Delaware. Rayner, have lost your picture. Oh, there you go. Sorry about that. Um, again, Ken Rayner of the Mecklenburg County Bar, and I represent the defendant, G. Park uh, Delaware, in this appeal. The um, the I think all of the believable evidence in this case shows that the transaction involved. Uh, GPAR and the Duries was GPAR, the Delaware company. And that started in the first note in the transaction of 2014. But Mr. That Rank, note, that, note wasn't a part of, that note wasn't a part of the record. What wasn't a part of the public record. It's a part of this record, but it's not a part of the public record that anyone could find when but, this deed of trust was uh, recorded. Is that correct? That's true, and I and I do want to kind of take a moment to uh, talk about the equities because the appellant's argument somehow suggests that they relied on looking at that deed of trust. But if you look at the 30B6 deposition of BB and T, the witness admitted that they did not search the title before they filed the deed of trust in Mecklenburg County. They didn't rely on whether uh, GPAR was a Delaware or North Carolina corporation, what they did is they simply cured their mistake, i.e. they filed in Union County instead of Mecklenburg. So what they did, they filed as quickly as possible. So there's no um, equities here in their favor that they somehow did a title search and relied upon there was a North Carolina corporation versus a Delaware company. Well, Mr. Rayner, I'm curious or concerned or at least questioning about, I noticed that your client, after they discovered the error in in the company, um, they had Mr. Gavigan or Mr. Gavigan file this affidavit with the Register of Deeds, but then did not file any reformation action at that point. Did Does the affidavit itself have any uh, effect at all in this case? Uh, Your Honor, I don't think it does. I think the um, certainly the um, it, it didn't preclude the need for reformation as I can see it, and it, it doesn't bar the reformation as I see it. And certainly uh, 
BB and T has not raised that as an issue, Your Honor. I think that was the, uh, the scrivener. <laughs> some effort to try to cure the problem, but I don't know, Your Honor, that um, that correction statute would entail uh, that change, uh, quite frankly. Well, what do you say about um, the appellant's argument that the entity that supposedly was the beneficiary of this uh, deed of trust didn't exist at the time the deed of trust and therefore it's void ab initio. Your Honor, the appellate keeps making that argument, but they ignore the evidence that the intended beneficiary was the Delaware GPAR. Uh, the North Carolina GPAR had nothing to do with this transaction. And that goes right back to the 2014 uh, note, which says it was a, a GPAR, a Delaware company, the um, in 2015, when they restated it, they said it was a North. When they restated the note, they said it was a North Carolina company, didn't they? They did, Your Honor. But that restated note was part of the document. Um, a part of the document called the Assignment and Assumption of Promissory Note Agreement. That was the master uh, contract that laid out what the parties were doing, and this is at the record on page 104. And that document uh, states that, you know, Mr. Dure is going to come in and basically step into the shoes of Tri-Cities and be responsible for this debt. It also says that he's going to give additional security, including uh, there was a pledge uh, document, which I think was Exhibit um, C, which uh, was said um, just like the assignment and assumption uh, that GPAR was a Delaware company. Um, the assignment and assumption of promissory note also identified two deeds of trust that were going to be given to secure the obligation to the lender, which again, the lender was uh, GPAR, a Delaware company. Those two deeds of trust were attached. And unfortunately, they both referenced um, a state of incorporation as being North Carolina as opposed to Delaware. And so um, the point being, Your Honor, is the transaction uh, by the parties was the Delaware company. There was no association with the North Carolina company at all. There was no uh, need to add the North Carolina company. And certainly there's no explanation in this record um, for North Carolina being attached as the state of the corporation of GPAR. And that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about anything else. And to go back to the, the explanation here is we have two attorneys who have each um, had some lapse in what they were doing. And we've got two attorneys with two mistakes here is what we're dealing with. Yes, on yes, both exactly. sides of this. Isn't that correct? I, I think that is correct, Your Honor, and and I would point out that all of the uh, evidence that's been uh, filed show that, and I would also point out to one missing piece of evidence, and that is BB&T actually obtained an affidavit from Mr. Dure, and they submitted that affidavit in this litigation, but that affidavit did not raise a single issue or fact challenging the affidavits of the three witnesses we we provided. It didn't say uh, anything about a reason why North Carolina was listed as the state of incorporation. And so, Your Honor, I think that's pretty prevailing, I mean, pretty persuasive um, evidence that the reason being is that they could have obtained that evidence from Mr. Dury, they would have done so. And the fact that it's not in this record indicates pretty powerfully that there's no other uh, reason other than the uh, drafters just simply made a mistake. Uh, I guess we're so used to saying North Carolina that they forgot that this was a Delaware company that they were dealing with. And and again, that is the change we're asking for. It's not as um, the appellate would try to say, it's a whole different entity. It's the same entity. The only change we're talking about is a reference to um, the state of incorporation. It, it would be similar to if I was the beneficiary of a deed of trust and somebody 
listed Ken Rayner, a resident of Delaware, who is now deceased, according to the appellate's theory, I would have no way to correct that problem because that Ken Rayner in Delaware has passed away now. Uh, but the answer here is that the entity was always intended to be um, the Delaware company. And um, your honor, I, I'm sorry, I keep cutting my camera off. Well, the Appleese don't really like your case of the Bank of Union versus Red Wine that you rely on heavily in your brief. Can you tell me why you believe it it, it uh, requires the result that you say it does? Well, Your Honor, it, it stands to me. It stands for the proposition that a a misnomer, the identification of a party, and and by the way, that party was included in that deed of trust for some reason. They just didn't, you know put that provision in the deed of trust. There was a reason it was there. But my point is, if you can correct a misnomer, you can certainly correct an incorrect reference to a state of incorporation. Um, that, that would be my point there. Your Honor, I would also uh, point out that, you know, the, the plaintiffs, I'm sorry, the appellants have um, addressed or attacked this reformation on the issue of uh, statute of frauds and parole evidence, but they've forgotten the case that they have cited, which is pretty close to being on point, and that's the Drake v. Hance case, which is uh, 673, 673 Southeast 2nd, 411. And, and that case flies in the face of what they're trying to do here with the parole evidence and the statute of frauds. First of all, they're trying to argue that the pro evidence doesn't apply, but in, but in, I mean, sorry, applies to bar the reformation effort. But in Drake, it was a very similar situation. It, there was a contract for the conveyance of a piece of real property. The contract referenced um, the property as a uh, lot 15. It was the mailing address, the 15, whatever the street address was. But then another part of the contract referenced lot 15 and lot 11, which was owned by the uh, parties conveying the property. The deed con conveyed both lot 15 and lot 11. And so the uh, court, trial court judge looked at the contract, looked at parole evidence, um, you know, evidence from the parties about their intent and the, uh, the court of appeals uh, basically said in that case, because the contract um, you know, included both lot 15 and then later lot 15 and lot 11, that uh, it was proper for the court, the trial court to accept testimony on the intent of the parties. And interestingly, in the Drake case, the, um, the defendants made an argument similar to what bb and is making in this case, and that is that well, you can only look at the uh, the deed, and they're trying to say only look at the deed of trust. You can't look at anything else, and and the court of appeals in, in Drake rejected that and basically said, and this was a case involving uh, where the court said, um, if a party can show a mutual mistake was made in execution of a deed, in this case due to the error of the draftsman, parole evidence is confident. Ev competent evidence to show the true intentions of the parties. That case is pretty close to on point here. The only difference being it's a deed versus a deed of trust. So, um, and then your honor, honors, I'm sorry, going to um, the uh, meeting the standard for reformation. Um, this case, the only attack to our showing of what I would consider to be um, clear, cognitive, and convincing evidence of the mistake is they want to make a big deal about Mrs. Dure. Uh, nobody says what her intention was, but I think that's a little bit of a red heron because if you ask yourself, why would she be opposed to or uh, in favor of GPAR NC? Um, LLC versus GPAR Delaware, there's really uh, nothing to show that she would be intending one thing versus the other. And I think what the answer is, uh, she was signing off her name on the deed of trust that her husband had promised as part of this assignment uh, 
an assumption of the promissory note agreement. So well, one fact, reason somebody might be she might not assent would be theoretically if this doesn't get uh, uh, reformed, then that that debt may does that debt go away? Doesn't that debt go away with respect to these people? Um, the um, the debt may go away as to her, Your Honor. I would suppose, but certainly they have not made an appearance in this case to challenge any of that. Um, and so, but theoretically, you would be correct. But then I guess, um, as far as I can see, you would be correct, Your Honor. Your Honor. So, but um, but that is the um, I think the evidence that to me shows it's clear, cognizant, and convincing evidence of the the mistake of the drafters um, and the the. Uh, Use of Mrs. Dure is really just a red herring, Your Honor, because there's no evidence of anything to the contrary other than she had to sign off because she had a marital interest in this property. She owned, you know, she was a joint owner of the property. Unless there's um other, and I will say too, um, Justice Gore made a good point. This case is different. Then the cases like the um, Bonera Cano versus JBSS case, where there was everybody agreed the intended beneficiary of the of the instrument didn't exist. Uh, this is the case where the intended beneficiary existed. There was just a reference to the wrong state of incorporation, and that's a big difference. And there, the uh, as acknowledged, I think by the appellants, they have not seen a single case or cited a single case that shows something differently. Can I just yeah. ask one question? Can I ask, can you hear me? I'm having trouble with my internet. Yes, yes, ma'am, I can. So, um, so you've several times said that it's just, it's just a question of the state of incorporation uh, and that it just referenced the wrong state. But there was, in fact, uh, a GPAR LLC in North Carolina, which was indifferent than the GPAR LLC in Delaware, correct? That is true. That is true. So it's not just the state of incorporation, but it is, in fact, we have two separate entities, correct? That is true. Um, okay. I just want to make that point clear because the 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 fact that the wrong state is is referenced means that we have two completely separate entities and not just a Scrivener's there. One thing I would point out, though, that the names of the companies are GPAR-FF, LLC. They, neither company uses the state of incorporation in their names. The other point I would point out, as far as I know, and certainly I couldn't find it and the appellants haven't cited it, there is no requirement that a scrivener include the state of incorporation of a company that's the beneficiary of a deed of trust. Uh, apparently, uh, that may be good practice. It may be helpful practice, but it is not a requirement for that deed of trust to be recorded uh, or to be enforced or the note to be enforced. You don't have to do that. And I would make, again, the analogy, somebody can make me uh, the beneficiary of a deed of trust, but if they uh, identified my uh, county of residence wrong, and said I was a, a resident of Wake County, and there happened to be a Ken Rayner in Wake County. Again, that shouldn't be grounds for me not being able to seek reformation and say, cure that so I can enforce my rights under this uh, note and deed of trust would be my, my position on the fact that, yes, that entity existed. And then in a situation like with me being the beneficiary of, of the note deed of trust, if all the evidence is to the effect that I was the beneficiary and not the other person, it's the same as here. All of the evidence is that it was GPAR, the Delaware company, and that's further evidenced by the fact that the GPAR NC did not exist at the time of the transaction. It, it was dissolved and we've admitted that. So it wasn't even capable of being the beneficiary at the time. And that's further evidence that the parties intended that it's GPAR Delaware that was going to be the beneficiary of this um, transaction. The um, 
I, I'll be glad to answer any other questions you have about the substantive um, issue in the case. Um, in, in terms of the, um, well, were there any objections at the hearing to Judge Bell considering any of these affidavits? Was there any uh, objections or motions to strike at the hearing of these affidavits? There were no uh, motions to strike filed uh, as part of the record. Uh, there was no, um, and again, there's no evidence in this record of there being any objections uh, to um, the um, the affidavits uh, on the grounds that have been raised on the appeal that uh, that I can see and certainly remember. Um, and if that answers your question, Justice Arrowwood. Uh, the other point I, I do want to make in terms of things being raised for the first time on this appeal, I do think uh, the appellate is now trying to raise the issue of attacking the reformation on the fact that it was backdated to be effective as, as of the date the deed of trust was originally filed. They have not raised that as an issue in this case. And I just want to point that out. They have not briefed that as an issue in this case, and certainly I would hope they would not be allowed to bring that up as an additional issue at this point in the proceedings. Um, so with that, I would I would turn to procedural issues unless you have any other questions from the uh, justices about these substantive issues. Um, the uh, I, again, I I think on the procedural issues, it's pretty obvious that. Um, GPAR Delaware, the intended beneficiary of this deed of trust, was a necessary party to an action which was seeking to terminate the deed of trust and invalidate. But counsel, you didn't raise that until after you had already lost, or Judge Bell had indicated that she was going to rule against you uh, on the initial one. Did you? Uh, well. We put in the answer, in the answer we filed, we said that GPAR Delaware was the real party in interest. Uh, in the discovery that we responded to early on in the case, um, we, like, for example, the request for admissions, uh, we said, you know, it was over and over and over um, that it was um, GPAR Delaware was the real party in interest. We said the same thing in the um, uh, interrogatory responses. But you so didn't move to admit at to dismiss for failure to 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 name a necessary party or anything like that. Well, I, I did not, Your Honor. That is true, and neither did um, the appellate. And I would just point out that both parties have a duty, as well as the court, to make sure necessary parties are brought into the litigation. Um, certainly, I wish I had recognized that sooner. I would have done so. I, I would have assumed that a, a party seeking to board a transaction or affect a, a, a record a matter, a matter of title would have tried to bring any party in that would be affected. I think um, there's probably a reason the appellate didn't want the uh, GPAR Delaware involved in this, but it is the obligation of all the parties as well as the court and as as the cases we cited, even appellate um, courts on their own motion have uh, you know, raised the issue and added parties or declared uh, rulings void because necessary parties weren't um, uh, before the court. And I think we, we cited the case involving um, the insurance company that came out just a couple of years ago as evidence of that. So, um, you know, if GPAR was a necessary party, and it was not too late for them to be brought into this action. And it's kind of interesting if you look at the um, summary judgment order that Judge Bell granted before she granted the motion to um, allow the intervention, the, um, that order said basically it was not binding on uh, GPAR Delaware. So that is an acknowledgement that the, all the parties were not available and present in front of the court for complete relief. And uh, she even said in that order, the reason why is because GPAR Delaware was a necessary party. Um, and then 
finally, I think um, any objection based on the uh, adding of GPAR was um, waived when the appellate did not appeal the granting of the motion to consolidate uh, because that in effect was a, another way to basically affect the um, involvement of GPAR Delaware into the 2000, the earlier case. So, and, and with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have at this point. Just Gore, just Collins, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear your rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first thing I'd like to do, Mr. Uh, Rayner mentioned the promissory note, uh, and contrary to what was stated earlier, the promissory note also identifies only GPAR FF LLC and North Carolina Limited Liability Company as payee with, again, the same address, 6300 Carmel Road in Charlotte, North Carolina. So there's no reference in the promissory note whatsoever to this Delaware entity or any notion that the Delaware entity was the intended beneficiary. And he also mentioned an assignment and assumption agreement, um, but the assignment and assumption agreement is referenced nowhere in the deed of trust itself. If you look at the deed of trust carefully in the record, the only other document it references is the promissory note, which again, as you just saw, doesn't identify the Delaware entity at all, but only the North Carolina entity. So there's no ambiguity whatsoever from the deed of trust. There's no latent That's ambiguity. the promissory note that it references, reference an assignment agreement or? A... Uh, I, I, that, might, that may be the case. I'm looking at it now. It, it does reference that, Your Honor, but the promissory, I mean, the deed of trust itself doesn't reference the assignment agreement at all. Um, Quick question for you. Um, and I'll let you have a few more seconds after, since I'm asking you this question. Thank you. Um, let's say that the deed of trust had been, and I'm going to phrase this in a hypothetical uh, that sort of goes to what Mr. Rayner was talking about. Let's say that there was a deed of trust that said it was to John S. Arrowwood Sr. And it really was supposed to be to John S. Arrowwood Jr. And at the time it was drawn, John S. Arrowwood Sr. was deceased and so was not an, a legal entity. Could it have been reformed then? Well, it depends on what you're asking. Under those circumstances, Your Honor, we would hold, we would say that that deed is void. Um, but here, I, I want to go to one of the points that you raised earlier with Mr. Rayner. There is a remedy, by the way. The debt doesn't go away. There is this assignment and assumption agreement purportedly between GPAR Delaware and the juries, and they can seek specific performance to get a corrected deed of trust from the juries and then record that deed of trust. They have so, so, but it's your contention that if if it had referenced senior and senior was dead, then it was void ab initio and that it under your theory junior couldn't be then put in even if junior was the only person alive at the time your honor i haven't thought about all the hypotheticals but let me let me go to mr rayner's own hypothetical earlier if there were a ken rayner in a different county in union county uh that ken and that ken rayner was dead uh, but the party's intent supposedly was that it was supposed to be mr rayner in mecklenburg county we would say that that's an analogous scenario to what we're dealing with here, that that deed would be void. And of course, the party would still have whatever specific performance remedies they have under the underlying contracts to get an actual corrected deed of trust. But in terms of establishing what the record shows in the register of deeds, we would absolutely say that would be void and not sufficient to establish priority based on the time of recordation. Uh, to the other point on this, sort of broad issue of intent that Mr. Rayner continued to raise. The fundamental proposition is that a void instrument cannot be reformed. And I'll give you another 45 seconds since I interrupted your closing here. Thank you, Judge Arrowhead. Uh, a void instrument cannot be reformed, regardless of mutual mistake and whatever evidence exists of the party's mis uh, intent, uh, wh whatever that evidence may be. JBSS stands for this. We cited that. The Woodruff decision we cited in our briefs stand for that. 
the statute of frauds and the parole evidence rule also independently precludes consideration of extrinsic evidence to change the beneficiary where there's no ambiguity. The Drake decision Mr. Rayner raised earlier, there was in fact an ambiguity in that case. The court held there was a latent ambiguity. Here, there is no latent or even patent ambiguity because there's a singular entity identified in the deed of trust as well as in the only document referenced in the deed of trust. Um, so the only other, all the documents here that with respect to the universe of the, of the deed of trust, there's no ambiguity whatsoever. Now, if the statute of frauds can be surmounted by the party's evidence of the party's uh, purported intent as to the in intended beneficiaries, we would say that's a slippery slope that effectively eviscerates the statute of frauds for purposes of determining who the parties are to an agreement. Uh, we also- uh, You're about a minute and 20 over now. Uh, could I request leave for just 30 more seconds, Your Honor? <laughs> Go ahead. And this is just to address uh, Judge Gore's uh, raising of the Willis case earlier. We found that during our break, uh, reformation was not allowed in that case. Uh, so I'll just stand on that. And then finally, as to in intervention, we'll rest on our briefs, except to note that to address Mr. Gainer's, uh, Mr. Rayner's uh, assertion that we had an obligation to uh, join all necessary parties. That is absolutely a requirement. And the way you determine who the necessary parties are is to look at the register of deeds to figure out who all the interest holders are. And that's exactly what we did. We identified GPAR North Carolina and sued them. And that's, a, that's another reason why the uh, what's on the public record is a critical consideration in this case. Thank you, your honors. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Sor, will you uh, close court, please? Yes, your honor. This session of the North Carolina Court of Appeals is now adjourned. Thank you.